Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Gianluca. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, thanks to Sol for the invitation. And uh, we are discussing the life vest or the wearable defibrillator. And as Gianluca has already introduced, there may be a kind of a little overlap in between what I will tell you, um, just because you all know many of these studies are, um, are larger registries. There are no randomized studies published so far, so we will focus on a couple of these things uh, during my presentation. Just so you all know what we're talking about, the Life Vest is a non-invasive temporary tool to monitor and treat ventricular arrhythmias. You can see this is the, this is the device. Uh, if the device detects a ventricular arrhythmia, it gives an alarm and the patient, if he is still able to react, so if he's not syncopal, is able to react on this alarm and reset the alarm. Otherwise, um, he will be shocked up to six times by the vest. This is, uh, this is the model and it's been integrated into the 2015 ESC guidelines. And there are two recommendations, a class 2A recommendation for patients with myocarditis and uh, LV dysfunction who are thought to recover, um, and the second 2B indication for patients uh, with um, poor LV function who have a, a temporarily increased risk of uh, arrhythmic death risk. Uh, and this for a limited period, and this may be bridge to transplant, bridge to ICD implant, peripartum cardiomyopathy, or early post-myocardial infarction phase. Um, in addition, as we've already heard, um, <clears throat> one of the key indications is actually bridging after ICD explant. So these are the patients who have the highest incidences of ventricular arrhythmia during this period, and so they need to, they may be protected uh, by the defibrillator. Um, I would like to discuss in more detail the two large registries that have been published. That is the Wear It Two uh, registry and the German uh, Wearable Defibrillator uh, registry. Both studies or registries have been uh, around the same time point. Um, 2,000 patients included in the Wear It Two registry, mostly for newly diagnosed non ischemic cardiomyopathy or ischemic cardiomyopathy within 40 days after an acute myocardial infarction or within 90 days after revascularization. And in the WERI2 were some congenital heart disease patients. Whereas in the German registry, over 6,000 patients were included in over 400 centers in Germany. Um, mostly, again, newly diagnosed ischemic, uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, um, but somewhere after ICD explant on the, uh, on the transplant waiting list, um, and some had acute myocarditis. Um, I have just summarized all this data to show you um, something about the efficacy of the wearable defibrillator. So it's in total over 8,000 patients, um, <clears throat> mostly, again, newly diagnosed non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or ischemic cardiomyopathy within the uh, specific time frames. Um, and out of these 8,000 patients, there were 1.4% of patients who received an adequate shock by the West. Um, 91% of these shocks initially terminated the ventricular arrhythmia, so in total, effective termination of ventricular arrhythmia uh, was done in 95% of all patients, so highly effective on the one side. In addition, some 1% of these patients also had sustained non syncopal so well-tolerated VT uh, that were suppressed by the patient, um, and the the defibrillator, the wearable defibrillator, detected them but did not give a treatment for this. Interesting to know is in these two registries, two thirds of the wearable defibrillator therapies were actually within 40 days after putting the defibrillator on. Um, two thirds of the shocks were for fast monomorphic VT, one, one third for primary VF. Um, and as we've already heard, 11 patients died wearing the defibrillator, mostly due to unresponsive ventricular arrhythmias. So it is effective, and um, uh, it is 
there is a high compliance, at least for a limited period of time, for the patients. Um, if you look into the main indications for putting on the wearable defibrillator in these two large registries, um, the most important and largest group is actually patients who have been newly diagnosed with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Close to 50% of the patients uh, received their wearable defibrillator for this indication. Um, and the incidence of um, syncopal VT or VF was 1.2% in this patient cohort. The ischemic cardiomyopathy patients were the second largest group. 30% of all patients were included for an ischemic cardiomyopathy within 40 days after an acute myocardial infarction or within 90 days after uh, coronary revascularization therapy. It's 50-50, um, so 50% after acute myocardial infarction and 50 after uh, revascularization. You can see that the incidence of VTVF is uh, higher in this patient cohort. In these registries, it's approximately 2%. So the wearable defibrillator effectively detects and treats ventricular arrhythmia episodes in this patient cohort, and the incidence of uh, ventricular arrhythmias in the two largest groups of patients is in between 1% to 2%. This leads me to the first major indication, which is newly diagnosed non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, and as has been already alluded, uh, the Danish tr trial is actually one of three randomized comparative trials looking into um, ICD for primary prophylaxis of sudden cardiac death in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. And none of the three studies actually indicated a survival benefit for ICD implant in this patient cohort. You can see that the scut have definite in Danish, they all reduce risk for mortality, but not statistically significant. Um, what they do, though, is they reduce the incidence of sudden cardiac arrhythmic death. So the ICD is effective in treating arrhythmic death, but it does not appear to, uh, to translate into overall uh, mortality benefit. The Danish trial um, has been published last year, so it was not included in the, in the 2015 ESC guidelines. Um, it was a randomized trial comparing over 1,000 patients putting an ICD in or not putting an ICD in. All patients were symptomatic heart failure patients, reduced left ventricular ejection fraction below 35% and non-ischemic etiology of, uh, of cardiomyopathy. As already indicated, approximately 60% had biventricular pacing devices. And if you look into the outcome of this patient, the overall mortality is not significantly different in between the two groups, whereas the incidence of sudden cardiac arrhythmic death is halved in the ICD group, but this does not translate again into a, a mortality benefit, either in cardiovascular mortality or overall mortality. Um, there has been extensive subgroup analysis from the Danish trial, more or less powered. The only, uh, the only patients who appear to uh, benefit in this subgroup analysis appear to be the very young patients. Um, it is of note that more than 30% of the deaths attributed uh, in the Danish trial were actually attributed to non-cardiovascular causes. Again, pointing towards comorbidities in these patients, and it's an elderly patient cohort, and the older patients appear to less likely benefit from an ICD in this subgroup of patients. So it may make sense to identify patients at high risk that would benefit from early surveillance uh, by an ICD or um, by any other means. Um, in Germany, we have integrated the, uh, the Danish trial into our recommendations for, uh, for primary ICD prophylaxis in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. So we have weakened the class one indication to a class 2A indication. We felt that it, we cannot generally recommend an ICD for patients with LV dysfunction in patients who have not coronary artery disease. And we felt that actually an ICD should be considered mostly in the younger patients without comorbidities and who have at least a life expectancy of one year. Um, putting this into perspective of the wearable defibrillator, um, the prolonged study, uh, which was already alluded to by Gianluca, um, 
actually was recently published a report on the patients who had a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. These were 117 patients who had a new onset non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, including 91 patients with non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. The others were mostly peripartum cardiomyopathy patients who received a wearable defibrillator for at least three months. Uh, and had an ejection fraction at the time point of evaluation of less than 35%. Um, and as you can see in this cohort, different to some other reports, uh, the incidence of ventricular arrhythmias was quite high. 10 patients, 8.5% of patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy that was recently diagnosed had ventricular arrhythmias, and eight of, these, eight of these patients, that is close to 7% of these patients, had appropriate defibrillator shocks from the vest. Um, pretty much the same, the same data is available for the non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy group. It's slightly smaller, so it's 6.6% .6 ventricular arrhythmias and actually 5.5% of, the, uh, of this patient group received appropriate wearable defibrillator shocks. So um, even in this early phase after diagnosing non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, there is the incidences of ventricular arrhythmia that may be potentially life-threatening. As you can see, the timing is within the first three months mostly, but not exclusively within the first three months but it may even extend for half a year to have uh, ventricular arrhythmias. In the outcome of the prolonged study, 38% of these patients had an established ICD indication after, uh, after the wear wearable defibrillator period. So this was not exclusively three months, but this was, um, this was sometimes, a, it was, this was a mean of 100 days, but some patients had their devices for much longer. Let me go on to a second group of patients which I think is even, is even more interesting. Those are the coronary artery disease patients who've had a recent acute myocardial infarction. This is the ECG of, an, uh, of a patient who had an inferior ST segment elevation infarction. You can see that uh, this was due to an occluded circumflex artery which was, uh, which was reopened and stented. Um, and the echo before discharge, so two days later, actually indicated an ejection fraction of 30%, uh, diffusely hypokinetic with a posterior lateral akinesis. So what we did was, in this case, this patient received a wearable defibrillator. This is definitely uh, something to consider. So he, because of his depressed LV function, uh, even though he had an acute myocardial infarction, and three weeks later, um, he presented with a defibrillator shock by his vest uh, for primary VF. So these patients may have a high risk for, for ventricular arrhythmias in the early phase. And I know you all know that this is not in the guidelines because there were two randomized controlled studies, the Dynamite and the IRIS study, both showing that an ICD in the early phase after acute myocardial function, so within 40 days, um, does not lead to a survival benefit in these patients. But even though there was no overall mortality benefit for early post-acute myocardial infarction ICD, both trials indicated a reduction of arrhythmic death by the ICD. And we know from different studies that arrhythmic death is still the main cause of death in patients after acute myocardial infarction, and actually the incidence is highest within the first 30 days after the acute myocardial infarction, as you can see right here. So in these patients, um, if, if these patients um, do not receive an ICD, we need to think about other means to protect some of these patients who appear to have a high risk for ventricular arrhythmias. In the two studies, the randomized ICD studies actually, um, the, the reduction of arrhythmic death was offset by a higher incidence of non-cardiovascular deaths in the ICD groups. Um, and I, I think that we really have to think about the non-invasive alternatives for an ICD in this patient cohort to, um, to potentially benefit um, for, for these patients. So um, 
Ejection fraction alone does not appear to be a good risk stratifier in these patients, and there may be other means, um, and I just wanna show you one slide for a randomized study that is ongoing that is recruiting centers in Europe um, for the PROTECT ICD study, which is uh, the principal investigators are from Australia, and they look into the, uh, into the role of early um, programmed ventricular stimulation in patients with an acute myocardial infarction within five days after an acute myocardial infarction and a reduced LV ejection fraction. This may not be 100, per, uh, 100 patients per center, but at our center we have a pretty large uh, acute, uh, uh, acute PCI group. We have 40 to 50 patients per year falling into this category, and in this study it is randomized EP study, uh, ventricular program stimulation, and if a ventricular tachycardia is induced, these patients will receive an ICD, or if there's nothing induced, they will not receive an ICD, and this is compared to the, uh, to the regular setting, which is uh, guideline-based ICD after 40 days if ejection fraction um, is still persists to be low. So in conclusion, the actual data means that the wearable defibrillator is effective in preventing sudden arrhythmic deaths. The largest patient cohorts that benefit appear to be the newly diagnosed non-ischemic LV dysfunction and the coronary artery patients early after acute myocardial infarction or revascularization is already indicated. And therefore, I think that patients with newly diagnosed non-ischemic etiology of systolic heart failure and an ejection fraction below 35% should be considered for the wearable defibrillator until they have optimum titration of heart failure medication and treatment, potentially also the uh, CRT device. And for patients with an ejection fraction below 40% after an acute myocardial infarction, the wearable defibrillator should also be considered at least for 40 days until re-evaluation, and maybe we have other means like programmed ventricular stimulation or the MRI, which may help us to identify patients at high risk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. This presentation is open for discussion if there are any questions. We certainly have time for one burning question, uh, and depending on the time, we will try to have a panel discussion in the end. Yes, please. Thank you for your nice data. Um, the incidence of sudden cardiac death in those who, who were wearing the wearable defibrillator is 1.6%. It's pretty low. Do you have any non-invasive markers that uh, go along with this incidence beyond the ejection fraction or program ventricular stimulation data that uh, might have pointed out the patients who are going to be defibrillated? Very good question, thank you very much. Um, actually, there are studies looking specifically in the patients with coronary artery disease and who have had a recent uh, myocardial infarction. And as indicated, in this patient cohort, if you do a program ventricular stimulation and induce a ventricular tachycardia, um, these patients have a high risk of 20% within one year to have another arrhythmic event. Whereas those patients who are negative in the program ventricular stimulation have a very, very low risk for uh, ventricular arrhythmia. So this may be a, a risk stratifier. The other risk stratifier may be the MRI, indicating the larger the size of, it, of your, uh, your scar is, the more, more you would ha likely have ventricular arrhythmias. But actually, so far, there has been no clear cutoff value to identify patients who will definitely benefit from an early ICD implant compared to not. So we're still looking into that data, and it's what going to be interesting. What about and late potentials? Well, and autonomic dysfunction indices. Um, this has been only studied, as far as I know, in the patients after a myocardial infarction. <laughs> And in the ICD studies, it was not predictive. So we don't have that data for the wearable defibrillator yet, but it's definitely something to look for to identify these patients. If I'm allowed, the last question. For how long you suggest the wearable defibrillator will be useful for the patient who wears it? <laughs> Very good question, again. So um, it's in between six to 12 weeks for the initial phase, um, but 
for example, in, this, in the data from Hanova, so from in the prolonged study, actually if they saw that the ejection fraction was, was becoming better for 5%, they would prolong the, the wearable defibrillator phase, for example. So it's, I don't think there is a clear Most cutoff. of the sudden cardiac deaths happen in patients who have left ventricular ejection fraction more than 35%. Exactly, that's the problem we're, we're facing right now. So it's not the, I don't think that the echocardiography is our best tool to handle specifically patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy.